Go ahead and turn to Mark chapter 14. And as you're turning there, I uh, just want to ask you a question. Have you ever had something that uh, you had to wait for? You had to wait for something dreadful. Maybe you were fearing the worst or maybe the worst even happened, but there was something that you were waiting for. Um, maybe this may be you or maybe somebody you know, uh, like a prisoner that awaits the verdict of a trial or somebody that's related to that prisoner. Maybe the results of a biopsy or a scan. Or I thought about this one. Um, hopefully we haven't experienced this, but you can imagine a parent or a grandparent wanting to know if their child is safe after they saw a school shooting on the news. Actually, one of the first school shootings um, that happened, if you remember, was at Westside in northeast Arkansas. And my cousin was actually at the school when it happened. And I remember watching the news and thinking, is my cousin okay? And, um, but that dread, um, that dread or the fear of what might happen or what has happened. And today we kind of see this with Jesus as he prepares for his passion. And by his passion, I mean his suffering and his death. The word passion in English actually for hundreds of years meant Jesus' suffering. It's what it, when you use the word passion, it just referred to Jesus' suffering. It actually, the word passion has its roots in the Latin word passio, which means suffering. Now, of course, today we think of other things maybe related with the word passion, but for a long time it just meant the suffering of Jesus. So if you ever hear that, that's why I pre, uh, my sermon title is Jesus Prepares for His Passion. And if you didn't know that, you may be thinking, well, what are you talking about? I remember in seminary, we'd talk about the passion of Jesus. Or you remember Mel Gibson's movie, The Passion of of Jesus Christ or the passion of the Christ and uh, you're like well, the passion I'm sure Jesus wasn't passionate about dying on the cross but that's what it means it means suffering and so Jesus was in our text today he was preparing for that suffering and while Jesus was focused on his mission to seek and to save the lost and to die for the sins of many he was not cold and indifferent we're going to see the real the really the human side of Jesus today in our text this morning, we're going to see that as Jesus prepares to bear the wrath of God for sinners, that he is abandoned and betrayed by those that are closest to him. Let's take a look at, we're going to start in Mark chapter 14, verse 26. It says, and when they, sung, when they had sung a hymn, they went out to the Mount of Olives. And Jesus said to them, you will all fall away. For it is written, I will strike the shepherd and the sheep will be scattered. But after I am raised up, I will go before you to Galilee. Peter said to him, even though they all fall away, I will not. And Jesus said to him, truly I say to you this very night, before the rooster crows twice, you will deny me three times. But he said emphatically, if I must die with you, I will not deny you. And they all said the same. And they went to a place called Gethsemane. And he said to his disciples, Sit here while I pray. And he took with him Peter and James and John and began to be greatly distressed and troubled. And he said to them, My soul is very sorrowful, even to death. Remain here and watch. And going a little farther, he fell on the ground and prayed that if it were possible, the hour might pass from him. And he said, Abba, Father, all things are possible for you. Remove this cup from me, yet not what I will, but what you will. And he came and found them sleeping, and he said to Peter, Simon, are you asleep? Could you not watch one hour? Watch and pray that you may not enter into temptation. The spirit indeed is willing, but the flesh is weak. And again he went away and prayed, saying the same words. And again he came and found them sleeping, for their eyes were very heavy, and they did not know what to answer him and he came the third time and said to them are you still sleeping and taking your rest it is enough the hour has come the son of man is betrayed into the hands of sinners rise let us be going see my betrayer is at hand and immediately while he was still speaking Judas came with one, or Judas came one of the twelve and with a crowd with swords and with him a crowd with swords and clubs from the chief priest and the scribes and the elders. Now the betrayer had given them a sign saying, 
The one I will kiss is the man. Seize him and lead him away under, under guard. And when he came, he went up to him at once and said, Rabbi, and he kissed him. And they laid hands on him and seized him. But one of those who stood by drew his sword and struck the servant of the high priest and cut off his ear. And Jesus said to them, Have you come out as against a robber with swords and clubs to capture me? Day after day, I was with you in the temple, teaching, and you did not seize me, but let the scriptures be fulfilled. And they all left him and fled. And a young man followed him with nothing but a linen cloth about his body, and they seized him. But he left the linen cloth and ran away naked. Well, the first thing we see in the text is that Jesus predicts his disciples' deser desertion. His disciples, he predicts that his disciples will desert him and leave him. And so, if you remember last week, Jesus and his disciples, they observed the Passover meal. And uh, Jesus transformed the, pa the meaning of the Passover and he taught them about the Lord's Supper. He instituted the Lord's Supper for the disciples to remember the death of Jesus, where his body was broken, his blood was poured out. And so they are leaving the upper room, and uh, verse 26 says that, um, that at, when they had sung a hymn, they went out to the Mount of Olives. So they probably sang Psalm chapter 118 is probably the hymn that they sang. And verses 27 through 31 is, the, is part of the conversation that occurs from when they left the upper room until they got to the Garden of Gethsemane, to the Mount of Olives. And so this is their conversation. Jesus, in verse 27, he predicts that the disciples will fall away. He says, you will all fall away, for it is written, I will strike the shepherd and the sheep will be scattered. That verse about the striking of the shepherd and the sheep being scattered is from Zechariah 13. And in that context, in the original context, God commands that the shepherd be struck down, that the sheep may be scattered as an essential part of a refining process that will result in the creation of a new people of God. And through the, or though the arrest and, and subsequent death of Jesus, that causes the disciples to desert him, Jesus' death is necessary in that it leads to redemption, a cleansing of sin, and the creation of a new people of God, the church. In verse 28, Jesus says that he will meet his disciples in Galilee. It says, after he's raised up. And now, of course, at, you know, Jesus has already told him three times he's going to die and he's going to, be, going to rise again. But again, the disciples, they, they're a little dense like we are sometimes. And, uh, but he says, e but after I'm raised up, I will go before you to Galilee. Jesus will meet his disciples where he first called them around the Sea of Galilee. And he will recommission them for the work of taking the gospel to the nations. And in Mark chapter 16, verse 7, when Mary and, Mag and Mary Magdalene get to the tomb, the angels tell, the, tell those two ladies, go tell his disciples to meet him in Galilee. But notice verse 29 we see Peter, we see Peter's pride. He says, even though they all fall away, I will not. Now I can imagine how all the disciples just took that. Jesus says, you're all going to fall away on account of me. You're going to be scattered. And Peter says, nope, even though everybody else does, I'm not going to, Jesus. He's got his chest puffed out. But notice what Jesus says. Well, or maybe this, I'm sorry. Have you ever done anything like that? Have you ever done anything? He said, even if everybody else does this or everybody else doesn't do this, I'm not going to do it. Maybe you've told God that. God, I'm never going to do that again. Or have you ever said, God, if you'll just save me this, this time, I'll never do it again. I'll never make that mistake again. And we've seen this before with Peter. The first time that Jesus spoke of his death and resurrection in Mark chapter 8, what did Peter do? Peter rebuked Jesus and said, no, that's not going to happen. And Jesus said, get behind me, Satan. He was saying, you're speaking demonic words. You're arguing with the words of God and you're saying things that are not true. And Jesus, in verse 30, 
he singles out Peter, and look what he says. Truly, I say to you, or truly I tell you, this very night, before the rooster crows twice, you will deny me three times. Jesus says the word truly, or your translation might say verily. That is for emphasis. Jesus is saying, this will happen. Truly I say to you, or verily I say to you. Jesus, look at the, he says, truly, and then he says, this very night, before the rooster, before the rooster crows twice, you will deny me three times. Notice how specific all of that is. This night, this very night, before the rooster crows twice, you will deny me three times times. Jesus knows exactly what's going to happen. Jesus' omniscience, his knowledge, his knowledge of all things is on display with the specificity that he gives to Peter. But notice verse 31, Peter doubles down, but he said emphatically, if I must die with you, I will not deny you. And notice, we sometimes skip over this part, but it says, and they all said the same. Maybe they didn't say it as emphatically as Peter, but they all said that we're going to stick with you, Jesus. We're going to be with you till, or we're going to be with you no matter what. I'm reminded of uh, how prideful we can be. Look at, or Jerry, if you would throw that graphic up there. This, this, I saw this this week, and this is really the disciples, right? The disciples, they thought, no sin's going to get me. And the sin of pride just came right through the little lint, through the little opening there. It's kind of a humorous illustration, but I thought when I saw that, I thought, man, this is perfect for what happened with the disciples. They all thought that they were good. Sometimes we think the disciples were super spiritual, but if there's anything that we see in this text, is that the disciples needed the grace of God just as much as anybody else. The second thing I want us to see this morning is that Jesus prepares for his coming death in verses 32 through 42. Verse 32 says that they went to a place called Gethsemane. And the Gethsemane was an olive grove at the base of the Mount of Olives. And so they didn't go up to the top of the mountain, but they went to the base of it, the foot of the mountain where Gethsemane was, this olive grove. And it says there in verses 33 and 34, it says, and he took with him Peter and James, or I'm sorry, yeah, he took with him Peter and James and John, and he began to be greatly distressed and troubled. And he said to them, My soul is very sorrowful even to death. Remain here and watch. So Mark is showing us that Jesus was distressed. He was troubled. It says he was greatly distressed. And he tells uh, he tells Peter and James and John to remain here and watch. When I first read that passage, I thought, well, he's telling Peter, James, and John to do what? To watch for Judas and those that would come to arrest him. But as I read and studied, I think Jesus is not teaching them that, telling them that. He is teaching Peter and James and John how to handle adversity. We've seen throughout the book of Mark that Peter and James and John are full of pride. In Mark chapter 10, you remember James and John, they asked Jesus, Teacher, can we sit at your left and your right in glory? They asked in Jesus' glory to sit, to have the seats of honor, Peter or James and John. And Peter, here in this text, he says, even though they all fall away, I'm not going to fall away. Peter and James and John specifically were all full of pride. Peter has unequivocally said he will not fall away, even though Jesus said uh, in just a few hours he will deny Jesus three times. And it seems that Jesus was teaching them how to handle adversity. The disciples seem to have learned their lesson because in the book of Acts, we see the disciples who are, what are they always doing? They're always in prayer. Here, they are prideful, but in the book of Acts, They are prayerful. They were not led by their pride, but they were led by prayer. And Jesus wants Peter and James and John to know how to fight their battles. You don't fight your battles by just having spiritual pride and saying, well, I'm strong, I can handle that. But you fight your battles on your knees. 
when your soul is sorrowful, even to death, you don't give up. You stay awake, you stay vigilant, and you watch. Jesus was coming to terms with the terrible suffering that he would endure on the cross. And he was going to bear God's wrath, God's judgment, his righteous judgment for sin, for our sin. But Jesus was not just sitting around waiting for it to happen. Jesus spent time with the Father to gain strength for the battle. Look at verses 35 and 36. And going a little farther, he fell on the ground and prayed that if it were possible, the hour might pass from him. And he said, Abba, Father, all things are possible for you. Remove this cup from me, yet not what I will, but what you will. So Jesus, can you imagine the anguish, the agony of Jesus that he is, he says he, he went a little farther and he was, he fell on the ground. Now that's not something, sometimes we might pray from our knees, but I don't know about you, but praying on your knees, that's hard, just for a little bit, and you're like, man, even on a soft carpet, or even on a rug or something, or even on a pillow, but to pray prostrate, laying down, that, that means you're in anguish usually. You are desperate. And Jesus says to remove this cup from me, if it's possible. He says, all things are possible for you. Remove this cup from me, the cup of God's wrath. But notice what Jesus says. He he was saying, God, if there's any, God the Father, if there's any other way for me to be able to accomplish uh, this, to be able to reconcile sinners with you, to let this cup pass. But notice Jesus says, yet not what I will, but what you will. Jesus' intense distress is overcome by intense prayer. Jesus accepts God's will the same way we must, through prayer. And I think this is really the mark. Of course we know Jesus was a mature Christian. But the mark of a mature Christian is that he seeks God's will above his own. That it's not about what I want, but about what God wants. Perhaps in cancer... You may ask, um, God, would you please keep me from getting cancer? Would you heal this cancer? But you say, not my will, but your will be done. That you would use even this, even this horrible thing for your glory. I think of uh, Bethany's aunt. She had is it ALS, ALS or Lou Gehrig's syndrome. And, she, and that's a terrible thing. And there's really no cure. And as she got that, she was so faithful during all that. I didn't. I never got to meet her. But she was so faithful, and, I, and it was all about Jesus. And she wrote letters to her family members saying, uh, I don't remember exactly what all it said, but don't mourn for me. I've had a good life. The Lord has blessed me. And I just think, man, how, she, how, they, uh, how that God used her faithful, even in her suffering and her health, that she was faithful. And she said, not my will, but yours be done doesn't mean it's not painful Jesus is clearly in pain Jesus is in agony but he says not my will but yours be done or maybe when we think about healing a loved one that we think God would you please 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 do this but we say not my will but yours be done or a job maybe I want maybe I want this job or maybe I want a promotion but we say not my will but yours be done And why do we say that? Because we want God to get the glory and we trust that God knows what's best. I've mentioned it before, but I think of Garth Brooks and the song Unanswered Prayers. How many many prayers have we prayed that we wanted God to answer that he didn't, but then later on we see, I'm glad God didn't answer that for this reason or that reason. And I thought about this in this passage. I thought about prosperity theology. How prosperity theology makes it all about me, and it's me, 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 and and the Bible is about, and I'm extracting by, uh, verses from the Bible that say how I could get a blessing or that I could get this. I saw someone on Facebook the other day that's a, a member of a church, uh, nobody in here, but uh, this person had shared a post and it said, if you share this post by Friday, you will experience a financial blessing. And I thought... What a joke. That's not what God calls us to do. Are financial blessings fine? Yes. 
But that's not what it's about. I don't just post something. I don't pray something. I'm not praying for that kind of blessing. But true biblical theology and faithfulness is your will be done. Your will be done. I'm not trying to manipulate the scriptures to get what I want. And I'm not taking scriptures out of context. But what do we want? God's will to be done. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. What does it say? Your will be done. It doesn't say my will, but your will. That's the mark of a, or one of the marks of a mature believer. But verses 37 and 38, what happens? Jesus finds Peter, James, and John sleeping. Now, I can kind of identify with them because they just had a nice meal, right? They've had a meal. They've drank a lot of, lot of wine. They're staying up way, past, way longer than they usually do. Um, because Jews, they stayed up longer whenever they celebrated the Passover, usually till at least midnight. And so you can certainly understand them being tired. But Jesus says, he found them sleep, or it says he, he found them sleeping, and he said, Simon, are you asleep? Could you not watch one hour? Remember, si Peter just said what? I will die for you. Even though everyone else will fall away, I won't. And Jesus says, you couldn't even stay awake for one hour. Watch and pray that you may not enter into temptation. The spirit indeed is willing, but the flesh is weak. We must be spiritually awake because we will still struggle with the flesh. Galatians 5 said this, that there's a war between the desires of our flesh and the desires of the spirit. And we will never crucify the desires of the flesh if we are not spiritually vigilant. vigilant. And verses 39 through 42, and added with verse 37, three times Jesus finds the disciples asleep. So verse 37, we just saw that. Verse 39 says, and he went away and prayed the same prayer. Verse 40, he came and found them sleeping, for their eyes were heavy. And then verse 41 says, he came the third time and said to them, are you still sleeping? Three times he finds Peter and James and John asleep when he's trying to teach them how to handle adversity, how to pray to the Father. And Mark, what is he doing in this passage? He is contrasting the agony that Jesus was experiencing with the apathy of the disciples. And in this section, Jesus is described as greatly distressed, troubled, and sorrowful as he thinks about his upcoming death. But the disciples, the only concern they have is about getting some rest and sleeping. They are unaware that a spiritual battle is taking place and that their loyalty to Jesus will be tested. So Jesus prepares for his coming death. And then in verses 43 through 49, we see that Jesus submits to his father's will as he goes to his death. In verses 43 through 47, Jesus is betrayed at the hands of Judas. Verse 43 uh, says that Judas came, and notice it identified, Mark identifies Judas as one of the twelve. And it says that he came with a crowd of, with swords and clubs. The religious leaders, they brought an entourage to arrest Jesus. And they are ready to fight the disciples if necessary. If anyone was going to keep them from, try to keep them from arresting Jesus, they were ready to fight in verses 44 and 45, Judas kisses Jesus. That was the sign that he had given them. He kissed Jesus so the soldiers would know who to arrest. And this is disgusting because a kiss was normally a sign of deep love and affection. It was a stab in the back. It would be like if I shook your hand and then turned around and put a knife in your back. Look at verse Verses 46 and 47. And they laid hands on him and seized him. And one of those, but one of those who stood by drew his sword and struck the servant of the high priest and cut off his ear. As they seized Jesus, there was a minor conflict. And John's gospel tells us that Peter cut off the ear of one of the servants of the high priest or of the chief priest. And he drew blood. Peter drew blood, but Jesus, we're told, healed the servant. In verses 48 and 49, Jesus, he points out the hypocrisy of the religious leaders. 
He says, have you come out as against a robber with swords and clubs to capture me? Day after day I was in the temple teaching, but you did not seize me. Jesus is, Jesus is saying, hey, I've been in the temple every day teaching. You could, have, you could have arrested me then, or you could have done something, but you waited until the dark of night, and you acted like I'm a common criminal. So Jesus gives them a rebuke. But notice what Jesus says at the end of verse 49. He says, but let the scriptures be fulfilled. Jesus knows what has to happen. And Jesus is probably referring to Isaiah 53, which we read uh, at the beginning of the service. Isaiah 53, 8, listen to this. By oppression and judgment he was taken away. And as for his generation, who considered that he was cut off of the land of the living, stricken for the transgression of my people. Jesus was taken away. They, that he was seized. And verse 53 says that they led Jesus to the high priest. So Jesus submits to his father's will as he goes to his death. He has prepared. The reason that he can say, let the scriptures be fulfilled, is because he has spent time in prayer and he said, not my will, but your will be done. And the last three verses, verses 50 through 52, Jesus' disciples fail him in his time of need. Verse 50 says, they all left him and fled, just as Jesus said they would in verse 27. Now verses 50, I'm sorry, verses 51 and 52 is kind of an odd detail. It says a young man followed him with nothing but a linen cloth about his body, and they seized him, but he left the linen cloth and ran away naked. What in the world, you may ask, why is that in there? Well, there's two or three kind of explanations. Uh, I'm going to give you one possible. This is, this is not mentioned in any of the other Gospels. Not in Matthew, not in Luke, not in John. And some, some people think that the reason that that's put in there is because that is Mark himself. That Mark put a little cameo of himself in the gospel. And that it's perhaps Mark's family that, um, where they took the Lord's Supper in the upper room. And that perhaps, remember what happened. Judas left the Lord's Supper, if you're, or he left during the Passover. He left to go get the authorities. And so some scholars think that as Jesus and the disciples left for the Mount of Olives, the authorities showed up to Mark's family's house, to the upper room where Jesus was, and Mark was asleep, and he heard the disturbance, and then he followed the entourage out to where Jesus was, and that's why he only had a linen cloth on, perhaps his PJs. And then he started to follow Jesus. They heard him, and they grabbed him, and then he ran away. We don't know. But it's an odd detail and it speaks to someone that was an eyewitness to know that, to know that that had happened. But anyway, but why did the disciples desert Jesus? Why did they leave him after they said that they wouldn't? I think there's some things we can learn. The first thing is that we, like the disciples, we do often don't pray because we are unaware that we're in a spiritual battle or that we are experiencing a particular trial. We forget we're in a spiritual battle. Ephesians chapter 6 says to put on the armor of God. Why would we have to put on armor if there's no battle to fight? Adversity brings out the worst in us while it requires the most of us. Often a crisis or a trial reveals that our faith is weaker than we think it is. God uses these things to show us our shortcomings, to draw us to himself, and to conform us to the image of Jesus. And although Jesus warned the disciples in chapter 13, you remember that parable, or he says to stay awake, to stay awake, to stay awake, they remain spiritually groggy. And we must pray continually and always be spiritually prepared for battle. We will never be faithful in the hard times if we are not prayerful in the meantime. The second thing is that sometimes, like the disciples, we are spiritually asleep because we fail to recognize the onset of a trial or to accept it as God's will. Sometimes we stick our heads in the sand and say, I, I just refuse to accept that this is actually going on. Or if I do recognize that a trial is going on, I refuse to accept that, that, that uh, 
it's God's will. Or maybe I say, well, I'm, I'm butting up against this. David Garland says this. He says, the disciples heard only what they wanted to hear. And they tuned out Jesus' teaching on the necessity of suffering and the requirement of taking up a cross. They are like bad students who intend to quiz the professor about what is going to be on the exam and plan to study only the night before the exam. They are totally unprepared for the pop quiz. If you're a teacher or if, or if you're a student, I remember there was always the students. Uh, can you give us a study guide? Can you give us a study guide? I remember in college I was in an economics class and our, <laughs> our professor, he had given us a study guide because people had asked. And all he did was give us like 25 terms. And one of them was supply. And one of them was demand. Well, if you've had economics, there's chapters written about those two terms. And I, I was studying with some folks that night, and I was already prepared. I had studied. And I got to the, I got to the study group, and, and someone had brought in every term defined. And they thought that, that if they just studied those 25 definitions, that they would be okay for the final exam. And I said, that's not going to help a bit. I said, have we had any fill-in-the-blank or matching quizzes, tests? No, you have to understand those terms and the concepts. And they all went. And this is the final. I'm like, you're, you're in trouble, <laughs> is what I was thinking. But they hadn't prepared beforehand. They had only heard what they wanted. That's really what had happened. They had got that study guide, and they thought, if I just know these 25 terms, I'm good. They didn't hear all the part about, well, what about this term? Or what about this concept and how supply relates to demand and inflation and all this? They knew the terms, but they didn't have any clue. And that's how the disciples were. They had heard what Jesus had said, but because it didn't fit what they wanted to believe, they just tuned it out. Following Jesus will test our allegiances and will not be without pain and suffering. And then third, we often forget that the flesh is weak or we think that we have spiritually arrived. The disciples weren't praying because they thought they were brave. They thought they would stand with Jesus, but really they were full of pride. And when we're prideful, we don't seek God's help. We, we must ask the Holy Spirit to help us follow Jesus. We must implore God to help us to seek to reach people in the community. Jesus doesn't want us to be spiritually proud. Do we Should we be full of courage? Yes, but not pride. God opposes the proud, but he gives grace to the humble. Remember what Jesus said, watch and pray that you may not enter in to temptation. As I close, I want to leave us with a couple thoughts. The first is that as we think about the disciples, I hope that by now you, you see yourself. We see ourselves and our failures. Like the disciples, we have deserted those that we love. Like the disciples, we have betrayed our friends at times. Like the disciples, we are weak and we've been given to temptation. We have failed our trials. Like the disciples, we have sinned against God. And like the disciples, we need a Savior to reconcile us to God. And second, I want us, as we think about the failure of the disciples, we also see the faithfulness of Jesus. As Jesus prepares to bear the wrath of God for sinners like you and me, he is abandoned and betrayed by those that are closest to him. But here's the good news. He went to the cross anyway. He's faithful where we are faithless. And where we fail, Jesus succeeds. He came to, get, to give his life as a ransom for many. He lived a perfect life of obedience to the Father. And he died for our sins in our place. And we don't have to experience eternal punishment in hell because Jesus took God's wrath upon himself. But we must repent or turn from our sins and place our faith in Jesus. In the Garden of Eden, what happened? Adam and Eve said, not your will, but mine be done. And in the great reversal, the second Adam, Jesus, in the Garden of Gethsemane says, not my will, but yours be done. Eden brought death, Gethsemane, the Garden of Gethsemane brought life. For as in Adam all die, so in Christ all shall be made alive. This morning I want to ask you, whose will is being done in your life? Is it your will? Or is it God's will? Let's go ahead and stand as we have our...